Welcome to this battle map presentation on the Battle of Torrington, 1646. What was the outcome of the last forgotten battle of the First English Civil War? This first image shows a typical reenactment of a Civil War battle, an open field with armies clashing with pikes, muskets and cavalry. In fact, this is a reenactment that I attended only 10 years old. It was part of the 1996 Fire and Steel commemorations of the 350th anniversary of the Battle of Torrington. But it is nothing like the real Battle of Torrington, which was incredibly atypical of the time, as we shall see. Not only that, but in the same year and in the same summer, a local organisation called the Cavaliers, which will become obvious why they were named that, decided to build a replica of Torrington Church as it looked in the year 1646. This was a bonfire that was subsequently burnt down. Actually quite a fitting end, rather than a disrespect. Well, let's find out why these events happened, what the Battle of Torrington was like, and why it might be considered such a forgotten battle. By way of an introduction, let's put Torrington in context. Most historians believe that Naseby in 1645 was the more important battle, and that therefore it is considered the last battle of the Civil War. Perhaps this is fair. After all, King Charles's last main army in the field was defeated and destroyed at Naseby. However, Torrington was almost a year later. So why was Torrington still important? That's something that we're hoping to address as part of this presentation. Now, I happen to grow up in Torrington. I'm a Torrington native, you might say. And so I know the town well and I'm familiar with its Civil War history. That's also why I was able to take part in the celebrations in, uh, for the 350th anniversary. However, I've been able to draw on several sources to put this together. My key resources are The Forgotten Battle, Torrington 1646 by John Wardman. John Wardman is a local historian who's lived in the area for many years and he did a lot of research surrounding the battle during those 350th uh, anniversary celebrations. I was also lucky to be taught by John when I attended North Devon College as a student. His book is an excellent one and probably the best overall resource we have on the battle. It is out of print, but if you can get hold of a copy, it is well worth it. Another is the Torrington 1646 Heritage Centre. Although this is no longer regularly open to the public, some years ago while I was a student, I spent some time working with the Heritage Centre as part of my dissertation, looking at how history is communicated through education and heritage contexts. Also, the Torrington Civil War Town Trail, the red plaques of which can be seen throughout the town and correspond to a guide which tells you about the progress of the battle and many of the surviving buildings and streets that were a part of it. And lastly, I've been able to get a hold of Fairfax's dispatch to Parliament in 1646, or at least a facsimile copy of this. Thanks again go to John Wardman who was able to bring one of these into school, uh, along with several other documents relating to his research for the book. So thanks again to John. So why was Torrington so important during the Civil War? Let's consider the geography and its strategic location. On February the 16th of 1646, 17,000 soldiers met in battle in Great Torrington. To put that in some sort of context, Torrington today has a population of around 6,000 people, and in 1646 had a population of around 2,000 people. This was actually a very significant settlement at the time. On one side was Parliament's new model army led by Sir Thomas Fairfax. On the other side was the Western Army of the Royalists led by Sir Ralph Hopton. This battle was unusual. It happened in the streets rather than in a, an open field, and it happened largely at night too. Here we can see a map showing the rough balance between forces in 1642. The red areas are royalist, and the sort of greeny yellow areas are parliamentarian. You can see as the war progressed, initially the king actually managed to expand his influence across the country, especially after his victories at, at Walton Moor and, of course, the inconclusive engagement at Ed Hill, Edge Hill right at the start of the battle. However, the war started to turn against the king after Marston Moor in 1644 and even more ferociously after Naseby in 1645. But note that the West Country is still under royalist domination, with the exception of the port city of Plymouth, that is. This helps explain why Torrington was so important. The town of Great Torrington is situated in North Devon, indicated on this map here. Hopton's plan was to move through North Devon, including Great Torrington, to try and get around Exmoor and cut off the advance of the parliamentarian New Model Army. 
The New Model Army is the same army that was victorious at Naseby and was experienced, well trained and very well equipped. However, Hopton's Western Army also had some real veterans in it, but it was also by this point relying on some raw recruits too. On the other hand, Fairfax's New Model Army had advanced from Bristol to Exeter, where it had captured it after a siege. Following this victory, it decided to cut off Hopton's Western Army's advance. This meant that Hopton's army, rather than hunting the New Model Army, had become the hunted. Fairfax's New Model Army advanced upon Torrington. Again, I've already mentioned that Torrington was a comparatively important settlement at this time. But it's not just how big it was, it's about its strategic location. And that becomes clear when we consider the original street plan and also road plan of the area. This is a modern aerial view of this region, with Great Torrington shown in the middle. Great Torrington sits atop a very steep hill. This makes it a strategic location as it makes it more easily defendable. But what is more significant in this era of slightly more mobile warfare is the number of roads that lead into it. Let's consider some of them. Although certain other roads have been improved or added since by the turnpikes of the late 18th and early 19th century, all of the roads in red, as far as I've been able to ascertain, existed during the time of the Battle of Torrington, although many of them are really quite minor roads today. That said, they do lead to significant locations. Biddeford is only six miles away and was a largely parliamentarian town. Barnstable, similarly parliamentarian, was around 10 miles away. Both of these provided uh, ports which were strategically important too and had launched raids on Torrington throughout the war. Well, but however, Torrington had been able to repulse these. South Moulton is around 14 miles away. Exeter, around 30 miles away. Plymouth, around 40 miles away. And Holsworthy is around 13 miles away. And Lanson, around 24 miles away. Uh, Lanson being the local pronunciation of Launceston. So with all of these crucial roads leading into one place, Great Torrington, and with its two very strategically located bridges leading out of the town too, this was an incredibly important place to control. No wonder that the Royalists were keen to hold on to it, and no wonder that the Parliamentarians wanted to capture it as they advanced southwest into Cornwall. So Lord Hopton's Royalist garrison set up defences within the town of Great Torrington, while Fairfax's new model army approached through Kingscote towards Torrington itself. This was shaping up to be quite the showdown. We'll now consider the main events of the battle itself. I've had to simplify various aspects of the map here, but I've tried to give a flavour of the, uh, the town at the time and the events that happened within the battle. Here we can see one of my typically badly drawn Microsoft Paint maps. Nevertheless, I'm hoping that it'll give some idea of the layout and character of the town in 1646, with a few simplifications that I hope that you can forgive. The dominant streets are Calf Street to the north and Well Street to the centre. These are connected at the east with a short street called East Street, which is a pretty good name for it really. East Street also was flanked by part of the original medieval town wall, which made it even more defendable, something that Hopton understood well. Hopton himself was positioned in the centre of town near to the church and the square in the Black Horse pub. The pub is still there today, although I'm sure the food is a lot better than it was in 1646. The garrison had been spread throughout the town, with cavalry, which Hopton himself commanded in the centre, with a rearguard of cavalry on New Street under the command of Digby. The infantry, which made up half of his force, were positioned at strategic locations in the town, with a reserve in the centre of town and pikemen and muskets manning the barricades at Calf Street, Well Street and along East Street. These barricades require a little bit of explanation. The town at this point uh, is pretty narrow to approach as it is. Calf Street and Well Street are actually pretty narrow streets already. However, this would have been made into even more of an obstacle by the medieval town wall, but also the addition of turnpikes, which would have prevented the advance of cavalry, and gabions, which provided cover for the infantry. The pikemen could put their pikes across the top of it, and the musketeers could also fire over them as well and hide behind them while they reloaded. In essence, gabions are like big baskets filled with stones and mud, which can be used in a similar way to modern day sandbags. So overall, Hopton had chosen a pretty good defensive location with which to uh, defend Torrington. However, the parliamentarians outnumbered him. 
They had been advancing for a few days from Exeter and had recently passed through a few skirmishes in places like Kingscote. So they knew that they were likely to encounter resistance when they got to Torrington, and in fact they were counting on it, hoping to finish off Hopton's army before it was able to escape. However, by the time they had arrived, they had been delayed by fighting through the hedgerows. The hedgerows here are not just small. They are stone and mud at the base, with thick growth on top. Therefore, they provide a pretty formidable obstacle, and in fact, would even be good defence against artillery. Fairfax hadn't brought any artillery with him, though, knowing that the rutted roads in February of 1646 would have made it very difficult for his army to proceed at speed. Similarly, Hopton had no artillery, simply because he had no artillery. I should also point out for the church. This was one of the strongest buildings in town, and it was being used as the gunpowder store, but also as a prison. 200 parliamentarian prisoners had been kept there, and they were under lock and key. This becomes tragically significant later in the battle. The battle began with skirmishes between musketeers and other soldiers, including dragoons outside of the town. Fairfax wanted to probe the defences outside of Torrington, and the Royalists responded in kind. There was an exchange, it is said, of musketry and coarse language through the hedgerows. At this point, a few more forces were committed to it, but Fairfax was reluctant to commit more of his forces to this attack, preferring instead to wait till morning. However, the arrival of Cromwell changed this. Cromwell, being naturally a bit more aggressive, has suggested that the town should be assaulted even if it was starting to get dark. He feared, probably rightly, that Hopton would gradually withdraw his forces under the cover of darkness and that their chance to capture their, them there and then would be gone for good. So, as it was, Cromwell won out and Fairfax committed the army to a more general fight. Then night fell. This is another thing that makes this battle very unusual in terms of the Civil War. It was much bigger than a skirmish, but it didn't take place in an open field during the daytime. It happened in the narrow streets of Torrington at night time. This must have made it tremendously difficult for either side to recognise their own forces, and so field signs were adopted. The Royalists uh, were able to take uh, the gorse out of the hedges that grows all around Torrington to this day, and they adopted the field uh, password of We Are With You. The parliamentarians, on the other hand, adopted the field password of a manual God with us. I'd like to think that that maybe would have helped, but of course the confusion of the fighting in the streets would have made it very difficult to know friend from foe, unless they kept tight co cohesion as units. Nevertheless, a general fight developed at the Old Wall and at the barricades on Calf Street and Well Street. The parliamentarians put up a fierce fight here. But actually, the Royalists put up a fierce resistance too, and they're held up for a good hour or more at these barricades. Nevertheless, the experience, determination and numbers of the parliamentarian force began to tell. It would seem that Well Street began to falter first, and that the breakthrough occurred there, with the parliamentarians marching up the road with the pikes levelled. Calf Street soon followed suit. However, the Royalists weren't prepared to stop the fight just yet and Parliament by this time was committing most of its forces. Hopton needed to survey the damage done, and wanted to see how well uh, his troops were holding up in the face of such fierce fighting. He rode his horse down Well Street, at which point it was shot and wounded by a Parliamentarian musketeer. There are also some supports that suggest that Hopton was wounded in the face, although sort of the severity or even truth of this wound is very difficult to uh, confirm. What we do seem to know, though, is that Hopton's horse managed to stagger back to the square to the black horse, where it died. Hopton appears to play very little part in the battle at this point. He seems indeed to be more concerned with saving the rest of his army and allowing them to escape. But the battle was turning quickly against them. Fairfax's new model army and the parliamentarian forces by this point were forcing their way not only down Calf Street and Well Street, but down Potacre Street, Fall Street and Corn Market Street, where many of Torrington's shops can be found today. In amidst all of this fighting, though, there was a huge shock to both sides. <laughs> In a really iconic part of the battle, the church exploded. It is likely that this was the largest man-made explosion in human history up to this time. 
The Royalist Gunpowder Store is recorded as being 80 barrels. To put that in perspective, Guy Fawkes was only intending to blow up the Houses of Parliament with 30 barrels. So this was a colossal explosion and it destroyed much of the church, raining molten lead and masonry down on the people below. It is even suggested that Cromwell himself was nearly killed by falling masonry. But mercifully, no one else around the church was killed. However, there was a tragedy. Yep, those 200 Roy uh, parliamentarian prisoners who had been kept by the royalists inside the church were blown to pieces and killed. So, the explosion of the church really marks the end of the battle, but not quite. During this confusion, while Parliament was still trying to, uh, uh, to find their bearings, and with their ears no doubt ringing from the explosion, the Royalists decided to take some advantage and try and mount a, a more organised uh, retreat. Digby's horse counterattacked down New Street. This caused some confusion, and it took some time for Parliament to regain its composure and its order, during which time the Royalists were able to retreat down Mill Street. They went across the uh, the small medieval bridge at Taddyport and went then on their march down to Lansom, which they reached about two days later. This was a headlong retreat, but it was at least a little bit more organised than it might otherwise have been. Digby's horse was able to retreat down New Street, with parliamentarian cavalry trying to outflank them through the fields to the north of the town, but without success. Nevertheless, the parliamentarians had definitely won the Battle of Torrington. Although they hadn't entirely finished off this army, it was finished as a, a practical fighting force, and the rest of the war was simply them pursuing Hopton's army through Cornwall while it tried to avoid a fight before finally surrendering in March of 1646. It's worth pointing out too that this battle took place at night, in the dark, with matchlock muskets. It would have been incredibly difficult to fire these things with any sort of accuracy or reliability under these conditions, and they, this sets it apart from many other Civil War battles of the era. But that was it. The Battle of Torrington was over. The church would need to be rebuilt. And that is why, when the 350th anniversary rolled round, a great big bonfire was made of the church in commemoration of its destruction. And if you visit it today, you can still clearly see along the walls where the colour of the stone changes between the old church and the repairs. So why was Torrington so important? We can see in this image a large cobble-covered mound that can be found in Torrington churchyard. It is said that this is where the remains of the 200 parliamentarian prisoners had been buried, although there is quite a lot of doubt over this. Limited archaeological work found no evidence of any bodies being buried underneath there, but it does seem strange that it should be there at all, and it, doesn't, and it has not yet been confirmed what it's all about, so perhaps further work needs to take place to confirm that. What is known, though, is that the church did blow up, those men were killed, but we don't quite know, know why. It could simply be that Hopton did not want his valuable gunpowder magazine to fall into the hands of the parliamentarians, and it certainly in the dispatch was a point of some embarrassment that that gunpowder had not been secured. So Parliament won the battle, despite these losses. As a result, the King's last loyal army in the southwest was destroyed, or at least put out of action as a fighting force. There were few, if any, further battles in the Civil War other than minor skirmishes and it finished off much of the remaining royalist resistance in the UK after Naseby. Your tasks then, if you want to do these. Firstly, write out the results in order of importance, perhaps explaining your choice of the position of each outcome. And then, explain why Torrington might be considered the true last battle of the Civil War, not just chronologically, but in terms of finishing off the King's resistance once and for all. I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and that you found it useful. And if you have, do like and subscribe to the channel. But at that point, this battle map presentation is at an end. So from this proud native of Great Torrington, I say thank you very much, and us will be pleased to see another time.